Very good. Very timely too. Good. So just a few things to uh, cover. One of them is, uh, how many of you have been here yesterday during the uh, training opportunity that we had with the workshop that Bob Foreman gave? Can you raise your hands? Have you been here for the workshop yesterday? Other than Bob Foreman and Rick Taylor. <laughs> Richard Taylor. <laughs> okay, some people have been there. So I hope that was good. I thought it was a great opportunity to get um, people, uh, if they are uh, completely newcomers to the HPC platform or ECL, to get them started, uh, like sort of a, a bootstrap. But, um, but even for those that are uh, knowledgeable, uh, this uh, is a great opportunity to uh, get with Bob, uh, who is a very energetic and, 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 and creative teacher and always uh, finds a way to uh, make concepts more amenable and, uh, and, and more interesting. So I, I thought it was a great opportunity. That's why we did it. But don't feel deterred from learning if you have missed it. Uh, even though we did as much as we could to get as many people as we could in that room, we could only fit 20 people, so we got 21 inside the room. But <laughs> that, that was as much as we could get in. But if you want to do it, don't forget that we have all of our online learning uh, tools. So uh, all our massive open online courses are available. Um, we uh, have great content there. That is not just the theoretical content that you can get in the books. It's also practical exercises. And um, you get the uh, uh, possibility of doing this at your own pace. You can start from scratch from the very beginning and go all the way to become an expert uh, throughout all of this training. And of course, we have, in addition to this, all of the uh, WebEx-based training, if you want interactive training. And uh, you have also, of course, the uh, side classes if you want to get into more in-depth content. Uh, we are trying to also build content around practical experience there, so uh, use cases and other things that can be brought into this um, real-time uh, or face-to-face -face type of, uh, of training uh, and, uh, and work through a problem until it's solved with HPCC. And uh, by the way, for those that are local to the area, and I mean Georgia in general, uh, there is now the new certification program from Kennesaw State University. We have a number of people here uh, from that program. I uh, want to uh, make sure that you know about this program. They have a content that is HPCC uh, systems and ECL centric and uh, go through uh, big data analytics on HPCC. If you have people that you know that might be interested, please recommend it, get them to uh, know about it and, uh, and hopefully they will get it there and, uh, and help grow that program too, which is good. There is a uh, for credit uh, uh, part of it uh, so you get your accreditation for other majors, and uh, you get a um, certification uh, in addition to that if you want independent uh, for just learning reasons. So that's a one, one very good opportunity. Now, welcome back to our live audience. Uh, you are uh, now watching this second segment. This is our academia, HPCC in academia. And for the opening of this one, now we uh, will st we'll start to see how technical you are. This one is a very technical, and we'll see if we need to step back later on in future uh, presentations. But this is a heavily technical presentation around similarity search. For those that are not familiar with similarity search, this is a type of search when you're looking for text, your Google uh, search window, for example. But instead of entering the exact terms that you need to uh, look for, you enter something that is close enough. How do we get a similarity search to work to give you uh, what you expected, most likely, based on what you entered, even though uh, you are not exactly entering what is in the text? Um, so for those that remember our all Holy solutions, uh, this can get close to what we used to do with Holy. When is Holy back? I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> For the old timers in the HPC world, we have a system that uh, did and distributed in memory uh, processing, and it would do these things by just browsing memory across all of these nodes. Well, but in the case of uh, Fabian Fier and uh, Professor Christoph Freytag, they did this in a slightly less brute force approach. So they built uh, distributed prefix trees across HPCC. And now, how many of you know what a prefix tree is? Can you raise your hand? Oh, OK. Then you will learn. I let Fabian introduce you to prefix trees and how they implemented this to do distributed uh, searches 
uh, in inexact matches, approximate searches uh, on HPCC in a way that is very, very efficient and, uh, and very useful. So without more preamble, Fabian, let's welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Um, do you know one of these days uh, when you think, uh, when you feel like, I want to try something new today? Um, I want to do something really crazy today. You go to your favorite coffee shop and you see this offer, um, a matcha a cappuccino with uh, mustard. And um, <laughs> I mean, what could go wrong? It's your favorite coffee, coffee shop. Um, so. This is my story about this coffee here. Um, Flavio already introduced you to that problem, set similarity search, and um, I want to show you the, um, how we tried uh, to solve this. So, set similarity search. Uh, our input is a, um, a set of records R. Each uh, record um, is a document, for example. Um, each of, this, uh, of these records consists of a token set. Um, each token um, represents a word, for example. And uh, we have a search record S. It also contains tokens, of course. And um, we have a similarity function, and we have a similarity threshold we deliberately choose. Uh, the output are all um, pairs of records uh, which actually uh, fulfill the similarity threshold. So here we have an example of a set similarity function. This is the Jacquard similarity function. And we see two records here, R and S. Um, as we can see, they share three tokens um, out of eight. Um, so the Jacquard similarity would be 3 8 There are many other uh, similarity functions, many other set similarity functions. And uh, what I'm talking about here is general, but this is just an example to give you an uh, an idea about uh, these functions. So a naive approach um, to compute such a similarity search would be to just go through all documents and um, compare them to our search document, right? Um, that's maybe not so efficient when we, we are talking about big data. So um, I'm coming from the database research, so what we do when we see that problem is always indexing. So what indexes do we know? Um, usually we use uh, inverted indexes here. Um, Any time I talk about indexes here, I mean distributed indexes. So inverted index would work for this here, and um, it can be optimized using filters. I'll go into that um, in a minute. And uh, now we come to the coffee. Um, our new approach, the prefix tree. Uh, so, okay, let's start with the inverted index. So these are our input records here, um, R1 to R5. Um, each one contains uh, tokens. For example, R1 contains the tokens A, B, and E. And um, now we switch that around. So we want to have a list of each record um, that a certain token is contained in. So this would be the inverted index out of this input here. Um, the orange marked uh, letters, they are from R1, just as an example, so that you can see where R1 is represented in this inverted index. It can easily be distributed, so you can just cut this index and um, distribute it amongst um, different nodes. And um, so, what, how can we use it now for similarity search? Um, we can probe this index. So we get, an, um, we get uh, the inverted list for each token in S. Um, and then we count the um, frequency of each contained record ID. Let's have a look at, it, at an example. So we have a query S, um, which contains uh, C, D, F, and G. And um, we get the inverted lists of all these um, four tokens from our inverted index. And um, there we see um, like all record IDs uh, that share these tokens. And um, we can count each of them. This is the overlap. 
Um, so we see, for example, R4 is contained uh, four times in these lists here. And with this information, we can simply calculate the set similarity function, which would be for fifth in this case here. And uh, if we choose a similarity threshold of 0 0.8, um, this would be a valid result. All other ones would not be because they are below this threshold. OK, so that's a baseline solution. How can we do better? Um, we can observe that um, records or documents with um, a certain length can only be matched to other th certain lengths. So um, given a similarity function and a threshold, we can compute this um, length um, um, interval. And um, we can use this here to prune um, Candidates. So in the last picture, we have seen we had four candidates. And uh, with this idea here, we can get less candidates. So we add the length to this index and use it to shrink the candidate set. So how do we build the index now? Uh, these are our input records again. And um, we just add another column, which is the record length. So for example, for A, Nothing changes. We just added um, the three here, which is the length of the record R1. Um, for B, we see uh, B three times now in the inverted index. This is because um, we have three different lengths of input records um, where B was contained. This is three, four, and five. And um, so this is how the inverted index looks now. When we probe the index, we just use this length information. So again, our search record here um, with our uh, similarity threshold 0 0.8, uh, we can say that the length of potentially similar records um, can only be between 4 and 5. <coughs> Just believe me this, I don't want to bother you with math here. Um, so now we can um, probe this record here with this, uh, together with this length information. So we probe for C and the length 4, and for C and the length 5, and uh, for D, again, you know. So we get these candidates here, and as you can see, um, we only have two candidates left instead of four. So that's a very easy way to get less candidates. Um, and we still get our result. It's the same like before, so we don't lose anything with that method. Let's get back to the coffee. Um, last year, I got to know um, Charles Kaminski. Uh, he's from LexisNexis, and um, he showed a very nice approach about uh, prefix trees for edit distance similarity search. Um, and he used HPCC in a quite sophisticated way for that, and I thought, wow. That's a cool idea. Um, I had a look um, at publications, um, and there was absolutely nothing um, out there that used prefix trees for set similarity, neither in the non-distributed case nor, nor in the distributed case. I was just like, that's cool. I got to try this. Um, so how does it look like? Um, we built a prefix tree out of our input records here. Uh, this is how the tree looks like. The tree has a root node, that's the little black point in, to the top, and um, if you consider R1, um, we go from left to the right, so we uh, put A into this um, index. Uh, since A is not contained yet, it's a new node. And then we proceed with B, and since there is no other record uh, that has any other token um, after the B, so B and E is unique here, so we can just uh, compress this uh, into one node. So the next node would be the BE node to the left. And um, now we already indexed R1, so we can um, add another leaf node here uh, for R1. So we continue doing this with all the other records as well. And this is the resulting tree. Um, and we also add these numbers to the nodes. Uh, these numbers denote the minimum length and the maximum length of the indexed records, which are in the subtree. So for A, it's quite boring because um, there are only like records one and R1 and R2, and they both have the same length, three. But for B, it's more interesting. They contain the records uh, three to five, and um, so we have the a range, length range of four and six. 
Um, so that was the building of the index, so how do we use the index? We probe this tree, uh, we start at the root node and follow all paths. So for each path, we discard the subtrees which fail the length filter. That's the same idea like before. And um, we applied another idea to also get rid of um, paths that actually have a um, too high mismatch. We can also say, um, given a certain length, um, how many mismatches can we have so that the records are not um, cannot be similar anymore. Um, so for this example here uh, to the right, um, we can say the allowed mismatches are zero for the length of four and one to the length of five. So we can also use that as a filter. Okay, so we also do that. Um, so let's have a look at, uh, at how we can query it now. So first we start um, with uh, A. Um, so we look at, um, at the token C in the query and we find an A and um, this is a mismatch. Um, but um, since we know now that all the uh, records which are in this subtree um, have the length of three, uh, we, can also, we can completely um, get rid of this subtree here. That's not contained in our result, definitely. So we proceed with B. We have one mismatch here, uh, but the length range is uh, within the allowed range, so perfect, okay, let's go on. Um, we find another node C and D, uh, still mismatch one. Um, there's no further mismatch, we have C and D in our query. Perfect, let's go on. So we find E, F and G with a length of six um, and six, so that doesn't work, it's too long. Um, if you go on here, we find F and G. That's exactly the record um, we were searching for. So, um, wow, that's similar. Uh, and so on and so on. So we can use these information to get uh, through that tree and find our similar records. We implemented that, of course, in HPCC. And um, we used um, an index for that, um, which contains all these prefix, no prefix node uh, or prefix tree nodes. The key is the parent node ID, starting from zero, which is the root, and um, the, own, the payload is the own node ID, the minimum and maximum path length, as we've seen in this tree before, um, and the record ID, if this is a leaf node, and the information, if this is a leaf node. Oops. Um, so when we probe the tree, that's quite simple. It's a breadth-first search. Uh, this is a loop and um, with a join condition. And um, yeah, nothing special about that. Um, one important point is uh, the token order. Um, I didn't talk about that yet. Um, we can apply um, the, or we can sort the tokens within our uh, records deliberately. It, this is a set similarity join, so the talk, so the order is not um, important to the similarity function. So, but which order is uh, is good? I'll come to that in a minute. Um, the token order influences the shape of the prefix tree and we experimented with uh, different token orders. So one important thing we applied as an optimization was we added the level number to the prefix tree um, because uh, we did in, with in each uh, join in the loop, um, we can filter um, the nodes of this level, so that's quite logical that this is faster than when we go through all of the nodes um, because they can come from all different levels of the tree. So we simply added an integer level to all the tree nodes um, and changed the index key um, to parent ID end level and added um, this uh, predicate here to the join condition. Yeah, our experiments, uh, we used many different data sets, uh, for example, uh, Flickr, DBIP, which is like um, uh, yeah, title and authors of um, database uh, publications, Enron, which is a mail data set, uh, things like that. We used US patent data from 2005 and 2010. All these um, data have very different characteristics. Um, some of them um, are highly skewed, for example, when it comes to um, 
uh, to the uh, global token frequencies. Um, some of them have very long records, some of them have very short records. So this is quite a nice um, distribution. Um, our queries, uh, we took 100 records from the original data set as one query and measured this runtime. And um, we uh, applied three token orders. Uh, one token order is least frequent to the most frequent. One is most to the least frequent and one is random. Uh, our cluster configuration is uh, six Thor nodes with uh, three Thor slaves per node. So how does the token order um, influence the runtime? Let's have a look at the tree first. Um, uh, when we put the least frequent tokens to the beginning, um, the tree becomes very wide. Right? When, you, um, when we get back to how the tree is built, uh, that's quite logical. Um, so we have a lot of very infrequent tokens in the beginning, so we have a lot of different nodes um, at the first level. Uh, the opposite happens when the um, most, frequent, most frequent tokens are at the beginning, so we get a very deep tree. So let's have a look. How is the runtime? Um, so we see um, the increasing, um, like the least frequent tokens in the beginning and more frequent tokens to the end. Uh, this has a quite good runtime, but for very high thresholds, um, the uh, decreasing um, the rind is better. But uh, this is just for this data set. For all other data set, it looks like this. So the increasing um, token order is better. Uh, result two is not so surprising. Um, when we add the tree level to this index, um, it becomes faster, uh, usually. Just for DBIP, um, for the incrementing one, didn't make a big difference. For the other one, uh, for the other uh, sortings, it made a big difference. Let's take a zip of that coffee. Um, so, as we can see here, um, the inverted index with the prefix optimization is usually the best. So, on the left picture, we see it's the lowest runtime. Um, on the right picture, we see it's the lowest runtime up to 80% uh, threshold. Um, below that threshold, the usual inverted index is better. Our solution is always worse. Toss that coffee away. Um, doesn't, ah, okay. Um, one important result was also um, stop word removal is quite important. So all of our data sets contained quite a bit of uh, stop words. And um, when we remove just a very little percentage of these, um, the runtimes become way faster. Um, this is not so surprising as well because uh, usually all these methods rely on not so frequent tokens. Um, what was interesting here is uh, like when we remove these 0.075%, um, the average record length uh, is reduced by to 44% on the 2005 patent data set and to 40% of the 2010 data set, so we have really a lot of stop words. Um, Okay, so this is the last result I wanted to show you. Um, it, it basically says um, the stop word removal is very good uh, because the, the red bar is uh, always the one, the result with the stop words. Um, like um, the, the blue and the green ones are the ones without the stop words. And as we can see, the rightmost um, uh, method, which is the inverted index with the prefix tree optimization, is always the best. So, thank you. Take home message use standard inverted indexes, add a little bit of sugar and no mustard. <laughs> If you have any questions, um, yes? Did you do any scaling experiments with how many nodes in, in the system? Yes, we started with less um, than these nodes. Um, uh, yeah, it actually scales quite well for a, for a very wide tree. For the deep tree, 
of course, there's not a, a much scalability possible because um, the runtime is dependent on the depth of the tree. So, yeah. Were these time stats that you provided, were these of the core time stats, or did you actually build an index in Roxy and you ran in Roxy? Because if it was Roxy, then I think from a real world use case perspective, these would be unacceptable timelines, right? I mean, the response times that you provided. Well, these I just were. wanted to understand what was the timeline. Okay. Well, we, we, these were 100 queries uh, subsequently, so the runtimes are for 100 queries. No, even if it is 100 queries, mm -hmm. Roxy is exactly designed to handle mm -hmm. 100 or several more concurrent queries at sub-second responses. Mm -hmm. But were these times from Tor or were these from Roxy? Tor. Because just to um, you know, get to that point of scalability, even in a deeper index, if it is in Roxy, mm -hmm. uh, it, it wouldn't matter mm -hmm. because it would, Roxy is automatically uh, distributed. Okay. Yes. So for the pre-processing part, uh, you have tried to remove the most frequent work, like some percent of the most frequent work. So have you tried to remove some of the least frequent work? So the question was, um, uh, I removed the, the or we, we removed the most frequent words. Um, what happens uh, when we remove the least frequent words? Um, we did not try that. Because some package, yeah, just will do this automatically. Like mm -hmm. remove the least frequent word also to avoid just maybe it's not deformity or something. and and yeah and also maybe uh, did you try to compare like stemming or like do not do stemming things like that. Um, we, we didn't really care about the tokenization too much. We also used just standard um, libraries for that. Lucene, I think, um, with the standard uh, uh, removal. Um, yeah. All right. Yes, one more. Ah, okay. okay. Can you give an example of how the uh, token length uh, it, it would be used? It seems like you can have similarity uh, with vastly different token lengths. Uh, so I'm not sure how you can use that as a criteria. Um, maybe I, I didn't get your question correct. Uh, you think of a data set which has a, a very varying uh, record length. Uh, or very varying uh, record lengths. No, you, you indicated that one of your uh, criteria was to filter by the uh, uh, to uh, token count. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just wondering textually how that works. I can uh, say the same thing in a lot of words. In little words, they might be ah. very similar concept. Yeah, um, this is, okay, this is very basic because um, like one, like of course you wouldn't, Practically, probably, you wouldn't compare whole documents with each other. Um, but um, when you think of applying this problem to pieces of documents, um, which have the same length usually, um, or similar lengths, um, this uh, can become more interesting. So sliding, sliding window um, set similarity search is on my um, notebook. Um, so we can use this method for that, which will be very useful for um, plagiarism detection. Okay, yeah, that is the, uh, the uh, key. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I just had a quick comment for the gentleman on the other side of the room, and that is uh, we have code uh, out there for prefix trees for Thor and for Roxy, and uh, they perform very well in the Roxy. I think, I think it was left as an outstanding question uh, since you were running them on the Thor. Yeah, anyone, anyone can use that code, uh, which is, is different than the code that the gentleman who presented was discussing, but uh, the prefix tree code is out there if you want to give it a shot. Thanks. I would have assumed too that in Roxy it would be way faster. Yes, yes, yes. Well, as anyone knows uh, who's used the HPCC, it, it takes the Thor a bit of time just to get all its bits and pieces together. Uh, the Roxy is ready to go, and, and um, at least uh, for the um, tests that I run, which which were around edits distances and edits distances of words. Yeah, it was extremely fast, uh, far faster than the naive approach. Either that or the upcoming Holy X. How about that? <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay. So yeah, this was very good. And, and uh, uh, Fabian at the end said something that was important. This was done in the um, context of uh, trying to identify plagiarism across documents. Uh, think of a book and uh, people that copy blatantly some paragraphs in a book. 
maybe changing a few words out of it. So this was the uh, original spirit behind it, but certainly the uh, uh, use of Roxy could uh, perhaps show uh, slightly different results, and maybe uh, we don't need to go back to our inverted indices uh, as, uh, as we thought. Maybe we can use prefix trees with uh, Roxy indices in that case. Anyway, so uh, for our next uh, talk, and this is a, of a slightly different nature, it's a, it's a more op uh, sort of operational type of talk, is uh, something that is called Haas. And for those in LexisNexis, I'm not talking about Regina Haas or Bill Haas or any other Haases that we have. This is HPCC as a service. This is running HPCC in a public cloud and doing that in a way that makes it both well-performing and also cost-effective. So for this talk, we have uh, Chin Zhang Su and uh, Vince uh, Free. Uh, they are from uh, NC State University, and uh, they've been doing uh, a number of things around HPCC for a number of years. But particularly this one, this one uh, is the one that I think has a, the broadest applicability because uh, the public cloud is the future for uh, many, many organizations out there, and uh, and this brings HPCC to that future. So. Please welcome Jean uh, and, and Vince. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio. Hi, I'm. Uh, this is Chin, and I'm Vince, and. Okay, I'm on the right slide. Thank you. Um, so anyway, thank you all for coming and listen to, uh, listening to us. We appreciate, we appreciate the time you're giving us. And we also want to thank, thank Flavio and Trish and Jessica and anybody else who contributed to this because for putting on this great event. It's really, it's really a great event and, it, and it's, it's really professional. And of course, we've come to expect that from, from not only this team, but from the whole HPCC team. I want to thank everybody who's put, who's put an effort into that because it's really a pleasure to work with a, with a product that is so good. I mean, and the documentation is excellent, the training is really good, and the, co and the, and the code really, really works well. And so Chin and I often find ourselves, work, we're talking about something, we need to solve something. We say, you know, um, we can't be the first one with this problem. Let's look around. There must be a tool that does this. And so we were doing this just the other day, and we were trying to resolve, resolve a problem. And we, we searched around, and yes, there was a way to do it already decided in the HPCC. So, one of the, so um, now that I say they have all these great tools, I did find a gap, and this is what we did. We found a gap, and we want to contribute back to the community, so we created this tool that we think fills a, fills a needed gap within the, within the HPCC infrastructure. So HPCC belongs in the cloud. So there's a lot of reasons why, why people put stuff into the cloud, so you can, and, and it, it just makes a lot of sense for many organizations to be in the cloud. The pay-as-you-go model just, just really makes a lot of sense when, you're, when you have a, when you have a um, a workload that, that changes. If it's elastic, of course it wants to be in, in you know, if you, if you can't, if it's uh, dynamic and you can't predict the load, then it's elastic and you really want it to be in the cloud. But even when you know the load, when you're predicting the load, and it, you can, you want to put it in the cloud because the pay-as-you-go model works well, really well. If you're only running a report once a, once a quarter, it's nice to be able to just run it in the cloud. So we thought we really wanted to put, a, that a lot, of, a lot of customers, a lot of people would like to use HPCC in the cloud for this kind of, for this kind of work. In addition, I found I, I was talking to a VP of a technology of a healthcare technology company a, a month or two ago, and I was talking to him, and he said he wanted to put everything in the he wanted to put everything in Amazon, and I, and I said I said why? I, I didn't say it like that. I was polite. I said why did you why did you do it? You know why um you know why are you know because I was really curious why why he wanted to put it in there, and he said because I don't want to be in that race. So I, I probed him some more, and he was saying that and he said a AWS Amazon has thousands of engineers working every day to make their product, to add feature to their product and make it more efficient and to get it running. And I have, I have hundreds of engineers and they need to work on my stuff, not on my infrastructure. And so there's a lot of reasons why we want to be in the cloud. So um, we chose to work on, a, on AWS and one of the things that we, that, that's really nice about AWS is that you can, it's really easy to, to get things running in the cloud. But even though it's really easy, it's not trivial. So this is an example of some of the screens that you have to go through to get, to get EC2 running, Amazon's uh, Elastic Compute, um, um, uh, Al Amazon, no, Elastic Compute Cloud. So, so this is basically a VM. 
So in order to get a virtual machine running, you have to click through a lot of different pages. It's nice. It's a wizard-based thing where you, you fill out a few things, you press next, and you fill out a few things, and you press next. And it's, it's, it seems to work really well. There's a few, you know, like it's, it's not just, it's not easy. I mean, you have to know what you're doing. And sometimes you get to something where you say, pick a VM. And I'm mean, sorry, pick a VPC, and you'll you'll have you'll have to if you don't have if you haven't already created one, then you have to click on a, on a page, go somewhere else on e, on EC2, in, in I mean in Amazon Web Services, and create a create a, a virtual private cloud, and then somehow navigate your say, well, way back to the to the wizard you just suspended, and then you can click and configure some other things, and so basically, it's it's kind of it's the problem with this is that there's a lot of steps there there. Uh, tedious, and they're prone to error. Well, Amazon knew that. Amazon figured that out a long time, a while ago, and so they created a tool called CloudFormation. And the CloudFormation allows you to, collect, to provision and manage a collection of AWS resources. And so you, you provide them with a template, with this, which is a JSON file that's basically the recipe for how, how to provision all these different resources. And it'll just stand those resources up for you over, over some amount of time. And so given that, you can create almost any infrastructure you want, including an HPCC cluster. The other thing that, the other configuration that Amazon allows is they allow a machine image. So a machine image is just the, the, the image of all the, data, all the um, you know, files on your, on your system. So when you, when you boot up, when, when, in the provisioning of the, of the EC2 instance, there's a point where they just copy in, copy in this image, and now you're running a Linux box or something like that. And so given, the, the CloudFormation template and the, AM, and the AMI, the Amazon machine image, we have a great amount of configurability, very flexible configurability, automatic configurability available to us. So in particular, what we chose to do in, in Haas is we chose to build an, EC, uh, an HPCC cluster. And so that's going to have mostly a whole bunch of virtual machines. And so, or so the primary resource is going to be these virtual machines. Amazon has a lot of choices for virtual machines. There's families for compute, compute intensive ones or some, or some memory intensive or IO intensive. And so you pick those families. And then you can pick the size. You can pick, some, you can pick uh, ones with just two virtual CPUs all the way up to, I think, what, like 64 CPUs. And so you can pick the, you know, you can, and this is, this is something that you want to be able to you know, configure in your, in your system. Um, we also um, um, provide, provide, uh, uh, we, we provide all the other resources that, that I'm sorry, the, the infrastructure then has all these other resources. And this is given, you can, the user can do this through a template through and um, define this, and then they pass parameters. So they can say, I want this many nodes, or I want this many nodes for this cluster. So it's templatized infrastructure. On the, sa on the other hand, on the, um, um, complementary to that, we want to create an image. So we want to create an, uh, a, an Amazon machine image so that when the, when the machine starts running, when it gets up and it boots, and it gets ready to start running, it already has all the software defined on it. And so in particular, what we need to do is put on, a, put on HPCC, we need to put on the, the, the tools that we wrote for Haas, and we need to generate this, this environment.xml file and make sure that's out on every, on every node so that we can fire up and, and get, the, get the machine going. So <clears throat> what, we, what we want to do, what we wanted to do was create um, a, a command line interface to, to this to CloudFormation template. Because even though they have CloudFormation template, and even if it were so easy that you just had to press one button to launch it, and, and it isn't that easy, but even if you did, you still have to fire up the GUI and press that one button. And you'd have to log on to your AWS account, you know, pass, you know, because they'll log on, you know, find the web page, log on and navigate to the page and press the button. And, and a lot of experts are, you know, like to work in their command line and not leave the command line. In particular, I like to. And so we can just type the, type the command right there and, and, and start, messing with, start playing with your resources. And even, even better than that, you can script it. Because of the way the language is, you can script it and have run a cron job and have the thing start off whenever you want to do. So what our goals were, were to make this command line interface because we think that's, that's a very desirable way to, to manipulate these resources. We're going to provision and manage the cluster. We also thought about we would like to use it for periodic workloads. Because as I said, that one of the big benefits of the pay-as-you-go model is for, the, is for the, the periodic workload. So we want to be able to support that. In order to support the periodic workload, it was necessary for us to be able to save the state as a checkpoint on some, and, and, and then shut down the cluster. And then when you, when you want to bring the cluster, you need to be able to restore from that state and start running the cluster where you, where you left off. 
And then the last thing was just a guiding principle of just all the things we do is don't implement something that already exists. So we have, so Haas, if you want to use our, our stuff, we expect you to use Haas, but then you're also going to use ECL or DFU Plus or even ECL Watch because we're not going to re-implement that. That stuff already works. You're an ex, you already know how to use that tool. So there's a lot of stuff that we just didn't, we didn't have to implement because it already exists. So um, what I want to do is say that even though I talked, to, we, well, so we talked about um, um, uh, periodic workloads. So they have an execute phase and an idle phase, of course. And then a kiss, again, as I was mentioning, there's this restore phase. There's this, you know, you have to provision the, provision the, the, the um, cluster and get it up there and restore the state. And then there's, a, and then there's a, uh, the little save phase. So there's four phases. And we want to try to contain costs in all these phases. So the idea was to figure out a way to, way to provision quickly and to restore as quickly as possible. Same thing with the save. And we wanted to reduce the offline costs when you're in the, when you're in the idle phase. The thing that Haas doesn't do is it doesn't uh, address the execute phase. That's, a, that's application specific. That's something that, that the user needs to do. But that is something that Chin was doing for his PhD research. And so he's looking into, into how to figure out what the proper uh, cluster configuration is for your application. And the interesting thing about Amazon with the pay-as-you-go model is that there's another parameter you can tune for. You don't just tune for time like everybody's used to in performance. You tune for cost. And so it might be cheaper to run for 15 hours on a, on a less capable machine than to run for 10 hours on, on, a, on a more capable machine. And so that's part of his, his dissertation research. And so as, as that, he's the first customer for the Haas environment. He's, gonna, he's able to use the Haas environment to launch these, launch these resources in there. And so now I'm going I'm to pass the conch shell over to, over to Chin and let him tell you about some details. So, so the OPPO architecture we have defined here is the master slave architecture. And because the master and slave node, they have very uh, distinct functions and requirements, they were put in two different uh, scaling groups, auto scaling groups. And we define a BPC to create kind of a virtual cluster and make sure that no communication is not a problem. And we implement this architecture in cloud formation template. And this template accept a handful of parameters. Users can pick the instance type and decide the storage size for different auto scaling groups. And users can also provide their own uh, customized uh, AMI. The class size is defined by the number of source nodes, Roxy nodes, and support nodes. So we already talked about uh, how we define uh, the whole architecture. Then the next couple of slides, I'll talk about uh, the commands that has supports. So there are three uh, major class of commands. The first one is the stack uh, class. User can use uh, the stack command to create or to destroy uh, HPC cluster on AWS. The term stack uh, is defined by uh, AWS to describe the collection of resources managed by cloud formation. And users can use this command to create multiple uh, clusters at the same time. Therefore, we provide a list command that you can track how many clusters right now you are currently running. And also, we have an events command that you can track the progress of cluster provisioning and deleting. The second class of command is the cluster command, and users can start, stop, and track the status of the HVC cluster. There are not many subcommands in this class because we expect users, they can use existing tools like uh, ECL DFU Plus or ECL Web Portal, ECL Watch Web Portal. In fact, uh, we implement this command by invoking the script provided by HPC systems on the master node. The third class of command is the data commands. Users can save and restore the checkpoints of the cluster right before the execution and right after the execution. And we use S3 for the offline storage. S3 is the object storage uh, provided by AWS. So we try to... Uh, design a checkpoint to be very flexible. There are uh, three major resources we support, has supports. The first one is uh, distribute file system, and work unit, and drop zone. Rather than do a single complex checkpoint in a single operation, we has divided this operation into three uh, components, three resources. 
And also, has this data command accept regular expression? Therefore, users can select parts of the data. So uh, we try to make this uh, flexible because we are not sure uh, what resource that users care about. So we would like the input from the community to tell us what are the most resources they care about. And the next command is the uh, data resize command. It is more it is likely that over time you may change the size of your cluster. Maybe the data size has grown just too large, you cannot handle. So you would like to expand the cluster. For example, you start from a two-node cluster, and then later on you decide you want to expand the cluster to a four-node cluster. So then you use the hash command, hash stack create four nodes. Of course, you have to configure this before, but that's the command you use to create a whole stack. Then the next command you might use is the hash data restore from the previous checkpoint, which is a two, two node checkpoint. And hash will uh, restore the data records and copy to the first two nodes. So we, we want to have the data across all the nodes on the four nodes, right? So we provide a data resize function. And what this function does is to use the ECL distribute function and redistribute this data partition on the four nodes. And it has provide, we implement this by generate, generating an ECL program on the fly and execute this uh, program on the cluster. Therefore, these two partitions will be redistributed to the four nodes. There are many ways that you can distribute these uh, partitions. And right now, we use only the default parameters. So we, again, we would like the input from the community to tell us what's the parameter that you care about. And then maybe there are only a few uh, common patterns, and we can easily support in the future. So we already talked about the commands that we support in Haas. And right now, I want to talk a little bit about, about the storage option, why we choose S3 for our offline storage. So during the, uh, the periodical workload, there are two phases. One is the online phase, the other one is the offline phase. And based on the storage you choose, you might pay different costs. The first uh, storage option is store elastic file system. And basically, this is AWS version of network file system. Each node mounts the entire file system. It is flexible. However, performance does not scale, and it's very expensive. For one terabyte data, you have to pay 300 per month. And elastic block storage is the mounted iSCSI variant. And while it is mounted, the big difference between uh, EBS and e EFS is that only one, uh, one variant can be mounted by one node. Therefore, it is partition storage. And AWS support a great feature that you can create a snapshot uh, of EBS and store in S3. Therefore, the cost for EBS during the offline phase can be reduced to a much lower cost. And the third option is to use S3 for your offline storage. But because S3 is offline storage, right? So when you want to use it online, you have to copy the data from S3 to EBS. While the last two uh, options, storage options, they have comparable price, but we think the third option, S3 plus EBS, is a better choice because it provides great, great uh, flexibility. For the pure EBS options, you have to store all the data, including the application data and up the whole operating system and the HPC system and the third party library you install. But for S3 plus EBS, you can select which part of data you really want to store. So we think the third option is a better choice. And of course, there is an overhead for the uh, data save and restore, so which is we're going to talk about uh, here. So here we present the preliminary result to show how much time it takes to save and restore data. So this evaluation is conducted on a four-node cluster, we use C4 large for the instance type. So as you can see that the save uh, process takes longer time than the restore process. And for the 32, or the reason is the compression in the save process is longer than the decompression in the restore process. 
And for 32 gigabytes uh, data size, it takes around 200 seconds to save and 70% of the time, which is uh, 140 seconds to restore the whole cluster. <clears throat> so uh, there is a trade-off between the compression ratio and the recovering safe and recovering time. So uh, right now, we do not support configurable, configurable parameters, but maybe in the, uh, the future, we can create a parameter to support which what kind of compression ratio you would like to use. So there's one more interesting thing about S3 we would like to mention. So S3 is a great storage. It provides a high, aggregate, high aggregate bandwidth. And, but the thing is, you need to make sure the object you store on S3, they are distributed across different uh, S3 servers. So the trick here is you need to create a different prefix for the object name. So that's, that's the way how we handle object store uh, in S3. So therefore, we can make sure that we utilize S3 bandwidth in a good way. So I will hand back okay. to Dr. Free. So, so thanks a lot, Jin. You did a great job. So one of the, one of the uh, joys of, of being, a, being a professor is, is watching someone mature to the point where they're your colleague. Or you. The bittersweet thing is as soon as they're a colleague, they expect you to graduate. To graduate them, and so that now Chin's ready to graduate. So all of you guys who are who have open open uh, uh, f requisitions, uh, you should talk to him. So um, this is a quick little uh, little timeline that, to show how how you how what happens during the during the stack create. So on the on the uh, y axis you see different um, AWS resources, and and on the y axis and on the x axis it's minutes. So it takes about five minutes for this, for this uh, stack to get created. The first resource is the stack. I don't know if you can read that all the way in the back. And that starts, that starts at the beginning and it's not done until everything's, everything's been provisioned. And then you can see some of the resources. I don't really, it's not really important what they are, but there's a handful of resources that go into, into, into being created in this thing. Some of them would depend on a previous resource being created. So you can see that the, the start times are staggered, uh, staggered down the line. The interesting thing here is you see that the largest cost is the cost for these auto scaling groups. And there's two of those, one for the master nodes and one for the, for the slave nodes. And these are the ones that provision the virtual machines. And the big, part, the big chunk of this is we're using a, we're, we, uh, our virtual machine, when it gets provisioned, it has to download a whole bunch of software. And so it takes several minutes for each virtual machine. to. But still, that's, you know, that's, a, that's, not, a, that's an un, not an unusual time for this, for this thing to take. So, um, just in summary, we wanted to let you know what, what it is that we created. Here's an idea that, man, there's three major, major task um, groups, and then there are subtasks within that. And so this is a good, this is a good, um, this is a summary of what, of what we created. We'd really like you to, like you to use it. And to that, and I'd like you to look at that, that, uh, that Q, take a picture of this, and that'll take you to the GitHub, GitHub site. There's the GitHub site if you want to write it down. We created a video. Um, which you can also watch. It's just, it just shows all these commands that we've, that we've run, and we put those things together. I want to uh, thank our sponsors. We got sponsorship from, from uh, HPCC Risk Solutions, and we also got sponsorship from Amazon so, to put this thing on it. And then I'd also like you guys to, like everybody out here, to help. And so how can you help it? I mean, use it, first of all. But tell us what's, what's wrong. You know, um, um, suggest features and contribute. In fact, we just announced it. The pub first public unveiling of this was last night at the poster session. Oh, and that's another thing. Go, go see Chin's poster in the break. Um, last night, and I already got a pull request this morning when I woke up. So it's fantastic. This is, you know, we've already got con contribution to the, to the site. So um, please use it. I, 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 I know we haven't solved every problem. We haven't addressed all the different use cases. If you have a particular use case that's enough of a pattern, let's, let's figure out a way to make that, make that a tool. So anyway, thank you very much. Okay. Then we move. Hi, uh, Chin. I have a question for you. Could you give us some details on how you used S3? And, and let me be a bit more specific. We, we've run into issues with S3 um, around um, connecting S3 into an EC2 instance and ensuring that um, the data gets written, uh, that S3 doesn't cause problems and doesn't cause our drivers to fail, uh, those types of things. So it sounds like you've had some success there, and I was just wondering, uh, could you give us a little more architectural detail on how you connected up your 
uh, S3 instances and wrote to them? Well, he asked you, but um, I think you may have made them. We may have been unclear. Yep. We, we copy from S3 into EBS. Oh, gotcha. So, so we, don't, we don't use a connector because we didn't find one that we liked. So maybe that's why. Yeah, we didn't find one we liked either. OK. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. So he didn't, sorry. <laughs> OK. Thanks, Jack. Great job. Oh, thank Great you. Problem. Thank you. Great job. So um, this is good. I think uh, when we discussed with Vince before, one of the other uh, parameters to tune was the uh, runtime because Amazon was charging on an hourly basis. So if you run a cluster for, well, it takes a few minutes to provision and then you run it for a couple of minutes, uh, the rest of the time uh, goes to waste until the uh, hour. So, but that's probably solved. Now Amazon announced that they can do this on a minute by minute basis. So it doesn't matter anymore if you need to run something for a couple of minutes and then uh, tear it down, freeze the data in an S3 bucket and come back a year later. So that's, I think, it's a, it's a great way to solve a problem without doing anything, just Amazon did it for them. Anyway, the next talk is an interesting talk as well. And this one is also in the in document search. And uh, this is Jerry Yu from NC State as well. And uh, he did a, a nice um, a research uh, job on a finding or defining a way to uh, identify uh, relevant documents. When you are looking for something, you have a pile of unstructured data, and you are trying to figure out which documents will contain what I need. And uh, he created something called Fast Read, which is called like that because it's fast that uses HPCC and Python to build this capability. So uh, please uh, help me welcome Jer to the stage. Jer. OK. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your introduction, Flavio. And uh, thank you all for having me this great opportunity to stand here and uh, present for my talk. And so to begin with, actually, let me introduce my lab. Uh, this is called RIS Lab. I'm from the computer science department from NC State University. And uh, the old man sitting like behind is also sitting here. He's <laughs> my advisor, <laughs> Dr. Tim Mendes. <laughs> And also, uh, George in yellow is also here for a poster. And uh, we be like in the front line, uh, like uh, counting from right, the second guy. Uh, yeah, he's, he's also here for a poster. So good luck for our poster computation. <laughs> uh, in the past few years, our lab has like done different tasks for uh, uh, like data analytics. And for most of the, for many of these data analytics tasks, it's more like finding a needle in a haystack problem. It's like we got uh, uh, like millions of data points, or maybe an infinite number of data points. And how do you find the interesting ones like you, you do really care about uh, without, uh, say, just evaluating all these millions of data points? And the way our lab does. Uh, solve these problems are uh, always like using a data miner to kind of learn the shape of the data and then uh, apply an optimizer to, to like guide the, the direction of the search to better, like to more efficiently find the data points that we care more about. And combined to together, we have these better decisions. And here today, uh, the use cases I will introduce today is uh, similar to uh, is similar to the task of final needle to to the uh, in the haystack job, but uh, kind of a, a little bit different. So the first use cases we present is uh, about the researchers, like when researchers want to, like before researchers ever do their research. The first thing they will do is just search online to see what others have done to solve the problem I'm trying to solve. And to accomplish this, you, uh, you might apply some search strings, and the, the result is the search engine will return you thousands of 
the research papers that others have done that might be related to your work. But actually, inside those thousands of research papers, only maybe uh, 50 of them or 100 of those are relevant. So the problem is how to bridge this gap, like within these thousands of research papers, finding the uh, 100 of relevant ones without uh, reading all these thousands of papers. For this task, uh, if we do this manually, like ask some graduate, hire some graduate students to review all these, uh, say, thousands of research papers, it usually it requires weeks to months of work to do this. So this is a huge burden. We, uh, what we try to do is to cut down this cost to maybe just reviewing hundreds of the papers and to find all the relevant ones. So another use case we care about is comes from uh, Lexus Next Rally and they have these attorneys. Their task is to uh, hire attorneys to review millions of documents to find uh, that documents that might be uh, related to their, their cases that they can use as evidences to support their cases. And in this task, it's really similar. And uh, it is reported that if, if without any help of machine, it uh, requires like 60 of to 80% of the total cost of this case is spent on this process. So that's a huge task. And uh, for all the, both of the use cases, it's like finding a needle in the haystack, as we said. We suppose we have a set of candidate documents or papers as, can, uh, as a set of C, and the target is to just find the, uh, the, the set within C, which is R, and which are relevant. And usually this is only 1% to 5% of the total population. And what uh, these two use cases we care about are a little bit different between the task we have finished before, like the data analytics task we have finished before. The reason behind is there are, you, there are humans involved. And uh, you need actual humans to read the paper to decide whether it's relevant or not. And then you need actual, uh, you need attorneys to read this document to decide. Um, but why do you need humans to do that? Can machine just finish all these tasks automatically? That is probably because even human itself cannot model this, like how do they distinguish this relevant document from irrelevant documents? They can, they, they, Humans themselves cannot clearly model this process. For example, in the, for researchers, like when you do a systematic review, the review, like the real, the real protocol, which uh, indicates the criteria of which paper should be included, uh, which paper is relevant, and which paper are not relevant, is usually just two or three lines of like sentences indicating that if the paper is, is about A or B or C, it should be included. If the paper is about D or E or F, it should not be included. But you, you, like, you cannot build something like upon that to automatically cl classify papers. That is really unreliable. And same thing for attorneys. But lawyers do a much complicated job. Like if you look at the review protocols for the for these attorneys, it, you will find like ten or more pages of documents, which the human itself maybe uh, are just tired of reading these documents. <laughs> but anyway, they will make mistakes, and it is hard to use machine to model this. So, so what can we do to improve this problem? That comes our first talk. Like, instead of replacing humans to automatically do these jobs all by machines, we try to enhance the experience of the humans. Like, you spend like, less human time on this task by adding a machine to support all these tasks. Yeah. So, by the way, that was a really good talk, the first talk, and it saved me some time <laughs> explaining this. So, uh, just if we skip all the technical details of how we solve the problem of finding the needle in the haystack, we, can, we come directly to the conclusion we have done. We have created a tool uh, which can support all these review process 
from like uh, start with a set of thousands of papers and uh, uh, we try to find maybe dozens of the relevant papers and the result is we just need to read about hundreds of the papers. And the good news is that this, like, these hundreds, the, the number of these hundreds of papers does not rely, uh, like, does not depend on how many candidates you have. It's actually quite like scaling to, to the number of relevant papers. So, the, which means even if you have millions of papers and uh, only a hundred of them are relevant, maybe you just need to spend like reading a thousand to find that 100 paper. So we also have, oh, this is not good. Uh, yeah, anyway, we ha also have these uh, public resources online that you can use for tools. And this comes to our current framework, like when a researcher do these things, the first thing they need to do is to search online. And when they search online, they need to come up with uh, really complicated, like Boolean search queries, like uh, for example shows here. And after, uh, the reason for this complicated bo Boolean search query is because they need to have uh, as, like they need to, to cover as many as possible like this relevant paper. And after that, they need to download all the search results from uh, maybe multiple databases and form the set of C we use to start all two. And then they, they use all two, like supposedly these two works well and they read like hundreds of papers to find the, uh, the relevant ones. So this is a current framework, uh, even if we have finish everything we need to do with our tools. But uh, what I want to say here is uh, maybe a new free framework might be even better, which is the user search online with some really simple uh, keywords, just maybe two or, th uh, two or three keywords that might not be complete, but it's fine to just find an initial site. Maybe uh, just re like human review the initial set of maybe two or 20 papers and uh, label each as relevant or irrelevant. And then it can use some like APIs from the server to look into the whole data set, like millions of papers inside say Scopus data set and to predict on that and to find like suggest relevant papers among which. And so the uh, pros of this framework is the search is simple, you, you do not need the complicated Boolean search anymore. And then uh, you don't need like data extraction for the download and uh, there might be more potential results because uh, your, even your complicated Boolean search might miss some of the relevant papers. And also there are more user involvements like anytime the user can decide to start a search to like slightly direct that learner to another direction. And uh, yeah, it is the same technique as we like explored now, and uh, uh, can be uh, in, explored uh, like directly imported to this new framework. And there are like two maybe cons for that. One it might be scalability, and this one we might have a solution of HPCC, <laughs> and we are trying to do that, uh, prove that. And the second one is uh, maybe the cost to hold this service on, um, say, Scopus data side. But for this one, uh, I think like yesterday, when, when we were in the airport, my advisor might just solve this problem. <laughs> like he, he, told, he told me that you can put like uh, the training step of all, all your machine training like algorithms in the user side instead of in the server side. And in that case, the server only need to like know what your trained model is and just apply it with a simple linear computation and it will save a lot of cost to host this service on the server side. And yeah, I know it's a little bit scary for old men to be this smart, but uh, sometimes it helps. <laughs> so uh, let's come back to the Original question, like finding the needle in the haystack and how we solve this problem is a little bit techni uh, technical details. And as 
uh, any other researchers, there are all already existing related works to this problem. To like other researchers have solved, have tried to solve the same problem before. And the first thing we do, we did, is to look into like uh, search for that and look into all these related works. And as we found, there are two separate fields which has explored this issue. And each field has published several papers, and we have picked the state-of-the-art ones and listed here. And some of the papers are about the core algorithm, which uh, I use always like active learning. And so, uh, some papers are about like how to start this and uh, maybe when to stop, and the scalability, and also human errors. So uh, we start with the core algorithm, and uh, the core algorithm depends on active learning, which has a human in the loop involved. So supposedly we have a data set, like the C is com composed with K and U, which K is just paper that already labeled, and U is uh, the ones that we, we don't know whether it's relevant or irrelevant. And uh, we can train a learner to learn from this set, and uh, to learn from the set of K, the known set, and predict on the unknown set U. And with the prediction, you can suggest some papers, like select some papers and suggest it for review, for the human to review. After the human has decided whether it's relevant or not, it will uh, label the, the document and also this information will be fed back to the, uh, the data set itself and it will retrain, update the learner. Uh, in this, uh, when we are uh, like studying the problem of the core algorithm, we have several assumptions. Like, uh, yeah, just before all this, uh, before we have any data to learn about, like bef before we have any data belong to K, we use random sampling to sample from the unknown set. And there are assumptions like we stop when uh, we know the number of relevant documents in that set and uh, we can stop at like 95% recall and the corpus are not too large and uh, human makes uh, human never makes mistakes yeah that's a dangerous assumption but <laughs> 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 yeah. and uh, so we look at the three papers in the uh, like data art papers and uh, we found we actually found that there are very different aspects of this paper. They, 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 they all employ like different uh, techniques to that. And uh, so we decompose all these, uh, all the three state of art methods into four components. And uh, we try to recombine all these uh, uh, components together and form like 32 possible treatments, and we test all these 32 possible treatments along which the uh, three state-of-art state of ones are like just one of these 32 treatments. And what surprisingly what we found out is none of these uh, existing state-of-art ones performs best, like outperforms all the others. Uh, but, uh, in, but actually there is one a combination which takes like different parts from different uh, still other papers actually perform the best. And here is uh, we create four data sets and we show this uh, kind of the cost for getting the 95% relevant papers uh, from these four different data sets. And the blue bar is like the uh, combination we created called fast one and uh, it, uh, it is like uh, the cost is smaller than all the other state of the art uh, matters and uh, yeah and this cost is not like like e even though all these four data sets has different number of candidate papers the cost actually does not scale with that number it's uh, it's more related to the number of relevant papers and um, so the f second step we took is to remove the first assumption, like random sampling before is really stupid. Uh, and we look into other options, like uh, how do you speed up this process before you, uh, you have a learner to use. And there are existing papers, and following the same process, we 
like compared some baselines and the zero measures, and we have like proposed some all, all, our own measures. And the result is that uh, we found one of the measures is, uh, is better, and the other, uh, there is another measure that is also good for, like, yeah, just uh, don't have much time for that, so we'll just skip, skip the details. So anyway, to, this is kind of an illustration of the result. Like previously, is a solid line. If we don't have any like initialization techniques, it's a solid line. We start with random sampling. But uh, the, the problem is occasionally we have this runaway like, uh, cost. Like the random sampling just cannot find some useful information and you start, uh, you, you just end up with a really bad cost. But after we have employed this uh, starting technique by just like two or three words of keyword search, you can create, like, improve this stability of this result. And the third one, uh, the, the next step is to remove the, like, the assumption that we know how many uh, pa relevant papers in this set and, and uh, we, okay, there are some state of the artworks and we estimate this. Actually, we use some semi-supervised learning techniques to estimate the number of relevant papers in this set. And by doing this, like here is a comparison with the state of the art ones. The, the blue ones is, the blue lines are ours. Like with uh, reading like uh, 500 papers, we can get a pretty good accurate estimation of how many relevant papers are there in this set. And using these estimations, we can decide when to stop the review process. And here, it's the same graph, but uh, uh, the dashed lines are actually stopped by this estimation, and the solid lines are stopped by an uh, ideal case. Like if, if we know, uh, not estimate, if we know the true value, we can stop at the solid line. But yeah, it's not as good as the solid line, but the solid line is never achievable. So the, sec the next step will be uh, scalability, and uh, we, have, we have also uh, the poster yesterday, and it's still there in, the, in that room, is talking about use HPCC system to try to scale up these things. We, we actually scale two parts of that. One is to allow multiple reviewers to operate on the same product, review product. And the second part is to distribute the data and also the algorithm to like uh, work, the, the algorithms that works on the data. So our solution will be HPC systems, but we still are preparing for really large data sets to test whether this is, the scalability works or not. The final part will be whether human can, <laughs> like, if human can make errors, what, what we can do. And that is uh, still our future works. We have not finished that before. Uh, after finishing that, maybe, like, yeah, my PhD can. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, so this is, <laughs> yeah, this is a, like, uh, this is the same like page, like this is a tool here, and uh, all these available, like pre-printed papers, and all the tools are available. And I'm open for questions for like three minutes. Yeah, if there are. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. This is great. That's good. That's very, very good. Um, it's uh, interesting to see active learning also as, a, as another tool in the, uh, in the tool chest uh, to train some of these algorithms better and fine tune them. Um, I know that uh, our uh, LexisNexis sister company has been using active learning for some time in their editorial process uh, to fine tune some of the um, uh, selection in the machine learning algorithms on, on entity resolution and, and, uh, and, and best uh, content selection. But, uh, but this is good to see it applied in a, in a different context, but it's also quite useful. So now, um, a few things. First of all, as uh, Jerry said, uh, this is uh, 
part of a poster that it's in the room. So as you uh, go grab lunch now, please uh, use some time if you have to go see those posters. There are, if you like these last uh, few talks, there are plenty more of that type of material in the uh, posters room. So please uh, take a look. Uh, it, that's great material. For the live audience, uh, unfortunately, we can take lunch to you. So uh, you'll need to go on your own. And uh, we will be back in a few minutes uh, after this, uh, this break. For the others, uh, again, the robots are still in the back of the room. Uh, take a look at the robots. Talk to the uh, people that have been working on them. And uh, when we all come back, we have a great panel. So uh, stay tuned for that panel. And, um, and we'll uh, also announce the uh, winners, the poster winners, and uh, some of the other awards pieces that we have for that. I um, will uh, give you uh, about 30 minutes. So let's start, uh, let's be back in the room by uh, 12.35 if you can. 12.35, 12.37 if you want. <laughs> I'm gonna be generous today. Uh, and uh, we'll, um, We'll uh, get back into a great session with the uh, uh, panel, as I said before. Thank you very much. <laughs>